You're listening to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, Episode 64, Airbits Edge Security and Vault 7 with CEO Paul Puey. Hey, what's up? Welcome back to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. We're going to take a bit of a break from our series on virtual assistants, how to work with a virtual assistant and a virtual team. And I've got a couple interviews that we're going to release in a row here uh, just to change it up a bit. I was recently at the Anarchapoco conference in Acapulco, Mexico, where I spoke there on offshore banking and cryptocurrencies and what I call Anarchy 3.0 building freedom through entrepreneurship i'll leave a link in the show notes for that video on youtube but i met a lot of really interesting people and one of those people was paul way he is the ceo and co-founder of the airbits bitcoin wallet i had heard of paul before and i'd interviewed will pangman from airbits uh, almost a year ago but once i started talking to paul i was really impressed with his fundamental understanding of both offering security and offering a very friendly UI or interface and customer service to help people make Bitcoin easier to use in their everyday life. So after the conference, I connected with Paul and we found some time to record an interview just to talk about Vault 7, what edge security is, why Airbits takes security so seriously, and even a little bonus at the end where Paul explains how they use a decentralized network of Bitcoin nodes so that you're not dependent on just Airbits nodes to broadcast your Bitcoin transaction. Paul's very well spoken. He's got a very interesting background in engineering and small business, and I hope you appreciate this interview. Also, if you find value in the conversation, please share this episode with your friends. It's more important than ever for people to understand and start incorporating privacy and security and encryption in their life because we are absolutely being looked after by the powers that be. And you'd be a really good friend to help somebody out and get them on the right track. So without further ado, let's get the interview started. Paul, thank you so much for coming on to Liberty Entrepreneurs. Oh, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Yeah. So Paul, just give us a quick background of who you are and what you're passionate about. Um, so my background is as a software engineer. I went to Berkeley, um, UC Berkeley and studied software engineering, hardware engineering, uh, worked in Silicon Valley for almost a decade and actually did a complete 180 and worked into um, not engineering at all and actually exited and did small business um, operating anything from you know restaurants bars nightclubs to doing some outdoor guiding and, and running gyms but always being the technology person at those companies and um, that past kind of brings both uh, kind of a business side of what i do and the technical side of what i do and we've, i've kind of blended those two into my interest in airbits and when i first heard about bitcoin the technology side was obviously very very fascinating but also having worked in small business and dealt with payment systems and credit card and processing banks and cash, you know, working at a bar, you deal with tens of thousands of dollars worth of cash, wet cash, realizing that, wow, this technology is disruptive on many different levels, especially to that small business owner. And so this was a great opportunity for me to say, okay, I can take the technical background that I have, merge it with a lot of the business and kind of uh, payment processing, financial background that I've got operating small businesses and really try to drive a completely new user experience to this industry. Because when I first started to touch it, I felt like this was one of the biggest pain points was that it was so unfamiliar and alienating to the average user. And that's been our core focus in, at Airbits is to take very complex technology, cryptography, digital currency, and make it as familiar as possible. And that's how we define ease, ease of use. You know, it's a very subjective field, but we define it as you know what's familiar to people. So is it safe to assume that the libertarian aspects of Bitcoin wasn't what attracted you? I mean, coming from Berkeley, that's not known as a libertarian hub. Um, no, it's not actually funny. It's funny you should say that because I, although I came from Berkeley, maybe not a libertarian hub, but definitely there were a lot of people that uh, straddle the lines between obviously having a lot of issues with kind of large establishment. Mm. So. Just the opinion of saying, hmm, what, are the, what is large establishment teaching us? And is it the right thing that we should be saying to ourselves, um, uh, 
um, embedding in our in our minds as like truth. And so exiting the technology sector, um, going into small businesses when my mind started to feel that way, even before Bitcoin, especially working in the health health and wellness and fitness world where I said to say, hmm, the things that I'm being told to do, the things I'm being told to eat, the way uh, big pharmaceuticals is telling me to take care of myself are complete 180s from what I fundamentally felt was the truth and what I started to learn were the truth. And then you started to see how that ties in so closely with regulatory bodies. Like why are certain drugs getting passed? Why are we paying insurance for certain things? Whereas why are we not getting covered for others? Um, that started to, I wouldn't call it give me a libertarian bend, but it started to give me a very anti-large establishment bend saying that the bigger they are, the more they lie. And so that corresponded very, very closely to the entire kind of libertarian movement within the, I think, free market, uh, economic freedom movement of Bitcoin. And you combine that with me seeing some of the pain points in kind of the payment space through small business, it all clicked. I couldn't help but become suddenly just involved to no end. And I became actually the worst employee at my last job. I said, you know, I can't focus. All I could do is think about this entire space and how to become a part of it because I think it is the most disruptive and most important thing to, to hit our world in the last 20, 30 years. Yeah, I completely agree and feel you on that, Paul. I'm struggling a bit myself with the same feelings about how I'm just obsessed with this space, you know, coming from an engineering world myself, but then going into a, an offshore bank startup and just seeing firsthand how everything is restricted. There is no freedom of flow of money. Everything is picked at. You are guilty until you're proven innocent. And just mm -hmm. seeing how disruptive Bitcoin can be to this whole establishment. It's, it's very interesting because as I journey and try to build better ways to communicate the ideas of peaceful anarchy and a market driven society, you'll bump up into people like the progressives, for instance. And I know that there's a lot of them at Berkeley, but like you said, they are very skeptical of large corporations or large entities in and of themselves. The one that I was always able to connect on with these types of people is the federal reserve. Did you sense a lot of like disdain or mistrust for the federal reserve while you were at Berkeley? And did that have any influence over your gravitation towards Bitcoin and money in general? I would say they're not so much. I think, you know, being an engineer, you're kind of heads down and, and um, just trying to get your, your lab work done. Um, there was a lot of, um, and the funny thing is I, I actually had a, a silent disagreement with a lot of my peers as far as what they would choose to spend their time and lobby against or speak out against. And a lot of it was in um, kind of more civil rights oriented um, more civil rights oriented kind of causes. And so part of me said, well, you know, I've been always the, you know, let, let the strongest person win. Like if you're the smartest guy getting into the school, then, you know, so be it. And it was one of those always t tore me apart a little bit. Like, you know, do we pass regulation that makes it easier for someone to get in because of race, color, skin tone, or, or do we let the, the most eligible get in? And if you're truly going to pass things to give a give a pass to the disadvantage then really evaluate whether or not they're disadvantaged because i do believe that there's some benefit in that but i think a lot of regulations makes it where you don't really look at the deeper underlying history of someone's life because it's too hard to do that instead you just simply look at their race um, which is definitely too i would say too kind of lazy of a of a way of establishing someone's eligibility but it was one of those things where, like, you know, I've got school. I'm just str I'm struggling to get past this whole thing. Uh, I'm not going to spend my time, um, you know, uh, on Sproul Hall talking about about this because I don't feel passionate enough about it. Because I did feel I was always more towards the bend of, well, just you know, let it go, let it, let people be who they are and prove themselves. Right. Yeah, I, I have a similar experience coming in engineering undergrad as a, a white male. I definitely felt disparaged against a lot of the time and I'm not going to get into this too deeply, but I can definitely relate and empathize for what you're saying. Uh, you know, it's, it seems like it is very lazy, but the government in general is very lazy and they try to have this facade of helping people, but in the long term, it's actually hurting more people than it helps and preventing the people that have the credentials, the passion, the interest from getting in because you have some quota to fill never seemed to really right. sit right with me. But you know, I got into school. I was, able to go through graduate and it, it didn't actually affect me that much but I did have some compassion for my friends my male friends specifically who weren't able to get into the same engineering school that I did 
not because of merit based approach, but because they've had enough white guys in the engineering school. And, and that was that let's have a slight shift of conversation here. When did you start Airbits, and like, what was it that really gave you the passion to start a, a Bitcoin company? And when did you start it? Got it. So 2013 uh, was when I kind of learned about Bitcoin and really had the, co the concept and idea of Airbits about middle to late 2013 after trying to use Bitcoin, after trying to use it, trying to secure it, trying to be just a person treating it as a, a currency per se. And in that process, I realized some of the pain points. I realized how there is a different paradigm in this technology. Yet at the same time, we could we could blend it with what we're accustomed to. Like, how are we used to logging into accounts? How are we used to sending and receiving? How are we used to kind of traditional digital wallets operating? And so I kind of picked apart all the tool sets that are available to us that people haven't been using for client side security, the you know the encryption, backup tools, synchronization tools. And I said, hey, we could mirror that feeling that people have when they log into a mobile wallet, like a PayPal um, or their bank wallet. We can mirror that feeling while still giving them the freedom to own and control their own money, which even in 2013, prior to like the Mt. Gox hack, was still something I strongly had, had believed in. And so, you know, before a lot of the, well, there were already some issues even before Gox, right? Gox wasn't the first, but definitely was one of the worst. Mm -hmm. But I fundamentally felt, and that was a strong tenet, is that whatever we build, we definitely have to keep people in control of their own, of their own value. And that fundamentally is what we've been trying to do, but do it in a way where people don't have to do any extra work. Like they don't have to go through the whole process that they, that traditional wallets and cryptography make them in order to be able to control their own of, and their own value. Because fundamentally we think that if you want adoption of a technology, you kind of have to make it invisible. And Andreas put this really well at one of his talks on Andreas Antonopoulos when he said, the internet world was not really using cryptography at all. Unencrypted, there was no SSL, whatnot. And as much as we might hammer on uh, the quality of the security of SSL, it became so widely adopted because it was invisible. Mm -hmm. You don't do anything. You just punch in your URL into the browser and it gets encrypted. Right. And that's it. And so to me, that is effectively what we were trying to, to, to provide. We want to provide that level of invisible uh, security that users don't have to know all of this is happening. They don't have to go through backup procedures. They don't have to go through extra encryption steps. All of that is invisible to them. And that's been the tenant of what we're trying to build. Yeah. And what's the type of security that you guys use? I know that it's called news cycles periodically throughout the past couple of years, but you guys really, really revolutionized the game as far as security. What, what is the name of that again? Um, so we call it edge security, which isn't a new term, but I think we're we're tagging that term for the concept of client-side security, zero-knowledge security, uh, security that implements encryption on the client side to protect users' data in such a way that only the end user has access to the data. Okay. And so we, you know, I've given talks about edge security, and I credit other tools to being pieces of the edge security puzzle. Um, you know, if you've ever used uh, any tools to encrypt your data, right, um, BitLocker, or whatnot, that is a concept of edge security. Right. If you've ever used any what I call like synchronization tools, that way the, the data gets stored with you and is synchronized between your computers, that's a concept of edge security. Mm -hmm. So this is this is in general that concept. What we've done is we've put together a platform that puts that cr takes all of those packages of software, um, those concepts, and builds it into one. And then we've built a Bitcoin wallet out of it. Because really, that's effectively what wallets do is they secure keys. So we built a, a Bitcoin wall around that, that model of security where people can control, encrypt, and back up their own data. And now what we fundamentally think is important is that now we can take this platform that we built for our wallet and push it out to other blockchain apps. And in the future, even apps that aren't blockchain related at all, that just want to provide really good client side security for their end users versus trusting a central server. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, we're not but a few years out of having just privacy and security in the background of almost all apps. I mean, we're starting to see Apple and Google and, you know, these companies start rolling out encryption by default mm -hmm. in a lot of their products. Exactly. You know, this whole vault seven came out and where the mm -hmm. CIA can hack into our phones and, you know, get our encrypted information before it's ever encrypted. This is some big, problems that we're facing right now, but the movement towards privacy and encryption is definitely picking up. And just like I've thought that Bitcoin's best use case is what I 
Bitcoin, Bitcoin in the background, you know, just people being able to do transmission of money without knowing that it's using the Bitcoin protocol. All they see is it's fast, it's cheap, it's reliable, it's convenient, you know, and they can just send money to the Philippines or to Mexico without having to know what Bitcoin is or enable Bitcoin, just like what you're saying about security. They won't have to enable security or enable encryption. It's just going to be the baseline. It's expected. If you're not doing what Airbits is doing regarding encryption, then, you know, people are going to start moving away from your wallet and start moving on to people who take privacy very seriously like you do, Paul. Um, yeah, fundamentally, I think that is the the trend in the movement that we have. And so, you know, regarding the Vault 7 leak, and it is it is a concerning one, but I don't think it's a huge surprise, especially the people in the liberty space. We know that that government's been trying to do this. Um, I do take things, I, I take the announcement with a bit of a grain of salt in that there's the capability of doing it, it's, but is there the, there, there's always the capability of doing it, right? Hackers with enough money and energy and resources, whether the hacker be the CIA or the hacker be an actual attacker from an outside country, can get into, get into very targeted devices. The question is, what does it actually cost for them to do that? What's the energy involved in doing that, especially at a broad sweeping level? Like, can they go and basically monitor every single device anywhere in the world at the click of a button, or is it the fact that they have to go and say, "Okay, this is the one device that we want. Right. Um, let's now go and try to get malware onto that device by by intercepting the user's email and swapping it out with a piece of malware so that they would install it and therefore get this, and hopefully have the right version of the operating system which has this exact exploit that we can take advantage of." So, is this a targeted type of of um, of compromise that they could do, or is it a broad sweeping? Right. Now, prior to edge security, it's broad sweeping. Right, you're just putting your data into large trusted vaults of which governments can basically tap on their shoulder and say, "Hey, we want that data." And then it's broad sweeping, or you tap the wire. You just simply tap the internet wire if you're not encrypted. Then it's broad sweeping. So our goal is that there's uh, what we say is there's no such thing as 100% secure. Right, there just simply isn't. But eliminate the broad sweeping surveillance and visibility of your data, and bring it down to the fact that now you've got to go and and brute force and and target individual people. Um, an individual, worst case, even individual devices of which people could swap one to another and now have to put a lot of energy into that without even knowing whether or not you're going to get much value out of that one singular device. Yeah, exactly. That's kind of the trend we need to go down is, you know, as opposed to just being able to search your house, you'll need a warrant. And that's what we're doing in the digital space is making where they don't just search anyone's house. They've got to have a warrant. And that warrant is a tremendous amount of digital effort to get into any specific person's um, device and data. Yeah, it reminds me of the presentation that I gave at Anarchapoco. I titled Anarchy 3.0, basically build up your business, become an entrepreneur and make the government compete against you. And that's exactly what you're doing. You're spreading encryption and privacy through your app that makes the government have to compete that much harder to go after the users of Airbits. Right, exactly. And, and they have, you know, they have a, they're running a business, even though the government steals 100% of their revenue from us, the actual entrepreneurs and the workers, they still have a budget. They still have to run a business and they've got to make those business decisions to see is hacking this person worth it because they've got edge security encryption, right? It maybe it's not worth it. Maybe it is, but it really puts the pressure on them to now run a tighter business and whenever they don't have market forces being applied to them to generate their revenue you know they just don't make as good decisions as we entrepreneurs right. do that live in the marketplace yep. if you make it free for them to basically do broad sweeping surveillance then yeah they're just going to do it because it's it's basically why free. not yeah why not right why not yeah. why not because you know, they want the control they want the power so it in a way it's it's our fault you know as people for not choosing to actually implement a better digital a secure life you know, but at the same time, it's also it's also the trend of our world moving towards a more digital life and also the desire for convenience. So admittedly, a lot of the tools that we use today that do compromise our privacy do so at um, at the benefit of, of a significant amount of convenience. And so really balancing the convenience versus the tool set for privacy and security has been the big challenge because a lot of people say, ah, oh, you know, fine, they can see my data, but it's just so much easier for me to operate. Classic example, we're guilty. I am guilty of this as well, right? Um, Google, Google has made an incredibly great tool set for companies to work. Calendar, Gmail, contact list, all of it not encrypted, right. entirely sitting on their servers, whatnot, but incredibly convenient, right? And there hasn't been a tool set that offers that level of convenience with client-side encryption. That's what we're effectively building is, is the platform, the SDK 
to allow developers to start building out those type of tool sets that actually do implement client-side encryption, um, single sign-on across multiple apps, which is another thing that we've built. Google's got it. Single sign-on across, you know, not just calendar, Gmail, contacts, but also across other apps that use Google. That's what we've been trying to build. You know, one account, access to all these apps, all client-side encrypted. That is effectively what's been missing, I think, is that familiarity, that convenience that gets people to use it and then they get the privacy and the security for free without even realizing it. Sure. And I just want to speak directly to my listeners right now. I hope you see how Paul is building freedom by offering you a very secure means to store your Bitcoin and eventually manage and control your digital life behind this edge security so that someone can't so easily come and spy on you. He's building a product to help you protect your digital identity and your digital property. All right. I just want to throw that out there. Oh, thank you so much. Super appreciate it. That is definitely what we're trying to do. <laughs> um, Paul, let's let's talk about the way that you handle the Bitcoin nodes. I know this is getting into a little bit of the weeds, but some of I my people stop. Yeah. Yes, some of my listeners may not be familiar with this, but I know a lot of the Bitcoin community is part of my audience. Um, cool. Yeah, just to tell us the Airbits model of how you choose nodes. What, what is a node? Why do we need a node? And why do you pay such attention to the decentralization of the Bitcoin nodes that you use within Airbits? Got it. So Bitcoin is a decentralized technology. As such, there are just simply nodes out on the network, both mining nodes and just full nodes that hold and validate transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain. And those can be run by anybody. Anybody can go um, install some software on their computer or on a server on the, on the cloud and run a node. And what Airbits does is while we provide this interface for the user to feel like they are logging into account, it feels like they're logging into a centralized uh, service. Really what they're doing is they're encrypting and decrypting their private keys. And the important part is once they've decrypted their private keys by just simply logging in, those keys are used to sign transactions and talk to the Bitcoin network directly. They don't actually need Airbits to talk to the network. And that's a very, very important distinguishing fact and that many of our competitors do not directly talk to the Bitcoin network. They talk through their own company servers and they require their company servers to operate. So if a company goes down, whether it's just a hiccup in the servers or whether they're taken down, then that wallet cannot send and receive money. And then you have to go through this entire process of, okay, well, let me extract out my keys, find another compatible app, um, put the keys into that app, and then send out my money. And from the viewpoint of reliability, uh, fault tolerance, we fundamentally think that access to a decentralized network is a very important thing, especially for digital currency. So that's what we've implemented. The phone itself, the app running on your phone, um, goes and it has in it a, a list of servers to start off with, which are these Electrum servers, which are a superset of the, uh, the Bitcoin nodes that provide a, a bit of additional functionality to a standard Bitcoin node. It goes and queries those nodes and then, and then gets more nodes from those nodes and grows its list. And from there, it, it it knows who to talk to directly into the Bitcoin network. And we run some nodes ourselves, but there's no guarantee that any of our users are talking to Airbits nodes. And there's no guarantee that users talking to Airbits nodes are from our Airbits users. They're just Bitcoin nodes. Um, so we fundamentally think this has tremendously increased our reliability and fault tolerance. And compared to some of our, our competitors, we have had to the best of my knowledge, zero downtime in the ability for a user to send and receive their funds, uh, especially dependent on our servers, because they basically just talk to the network. Right, exactly. Because of this node redundancy, it really strengthens your network so that I can have more um, confidence in being able to broadcast my transaction and get it picked up by a node, as opposed to other wallet services, and I won't name any names, who use only their own servers and maybe just one right. or maybe a couple servers and they haven't decentralized that so that if their Bitcoin nodes go down, well, that effectively stops my ability to transact uh, in Bitcoin because I cannot broadcast that message to the Bitcoin network. Is that, is that right? Correct. You can't broadcast and you also can't detect that funds are being received. Mm. Um, and that would be out of your control. It's just simply like that wallet cannot, cannot connect to the network because it has to go through a specific company and has to go through that company's infrastructure. Um, and that's one of the fundamental differences. 
Right. So one issue that continues to come up is the block size debate and how the blocks are getting full. And we won't beat a dead horse here, Paul, but I just want to get your opinion. You know, yeah, uh, I've got a quick opinion on this one. So I think it'll hopefully enlighten people. <laughs> Over a year ago, I interviewed um, Eric Voorhees and Roger Veer on my show about this exact same topic, block size debate. And it simply mm -hmm. has not really moved forward since then. I know that it costs more now. You have to pay more in transaction fees to get your Bitcoin transaction insert it into the next block or maybe the second block so that you can mm -hmm. send that transaction. What, if anything, is Airbits doing or what could you guys do to help people know how much to pay in order to get their transaction processed? So what we do is we actually ping multiple Bitcoin nodes and the nodes actually have software in them that looks at past transactions, looks at the number, uh, the amount of fees that people are paying for those transactions and how long it takes for those transactions to get confirmed. And it can actually recommend a fee based on how quickly you want your transaction confirmed. And since that is a almost like a service of each of these Bitcoin nodes, we we ping several of them and say, okay, well, here's several nodes. What is this? What do these four or five nodes say? And then we give, uh, we take averages of what those nodes say and say, okay, this is what we will send um, for a transaction that a user is crafting of a certain you know, kilobyte in size. But that's effectively what we do is we take these, the network uh, suggestions and aggregate them through several nodes and, and kind of create a moving average uh, to smoothen out any kind of statistical outliers as far as what the fees uh, suggested would be. But that has worked pretty well for us. You know, we have a high rate of, of our transactions being confirmed, probably only in, in quick transitions of transaction fees do we see transactions take longer than average. You know, when transaction fees spike all of a sudden mm -hmm. um, before they plateau, uh, during that transition, the estimation, since the estimations take into account history, so obviously history could incorporate the lower transaction fee before the spike. And so people don't realize that there's no such thing as an instantaneous detection of a higher fee, right? It's all about historical averages. And so um, during then, the fees might be lower than necessary. And, and during then, uh, confirmations could take longer than we are targeting. And so... Um, but overall, we definitely have, I think, we're, what I feel like are very good fee calculations that people have not had a tremendous amount of issue with, other, like I said, other than those those spikes. Mm. Well, Paul, it sounds like that you have, you and your team, of course, nobody builds on their own. You and your team have built an, an unbelievable product. It's simple. I've used it. It's resilient. You guys are pushing the envelope regarding this edge security and trying to help people control their own digital profiles, their own digital money, their own digital life. You know, this is, this is a wonderful service and a really perfect example of what a Liberty entrepreneur is out there building. And I hope it's inspirational for some of my listeners to start thinking about what are they passionate about and what can they build to create a freer life. And that said, Paul, let's move on into the, the freedom segment here. How has becoming an entrepreneur created more personal freedom in your life? Well, I'll say this much, um, being an entrepreneur, especially in the, in the Bitcoin space, you realize that you're uh, before, at least before being an entrepreneur in this space, I, my life kind of centered around kind of one location had been California, the U S and if anything, freedom of movement and freedom to really experience the rest of the world and see how people live um, has opened has opened up um, as part of being in the space, as part of being an entrepreneur, and especially an entrepreneur in the Bitcoin space. And so it's been so incredibly enlightening to see people of different cultures, of different economic backgrounds, of um, different, I'd say, uh, political backgrounds, and being able to experience that firsthand, whereas before, maybe I do a vacation a couple weeks a year. Um, I feel so, so incredibly fortunate to be able to experience those, those different backgrounds and um, areas of, of interest, different countries, cultures. That's the part that I feel like I've been fortunate and has increased my freedom, my freedom to experience the world. Paul Poy, you are absolutely a Liberty entrepreneur. I appreciate what you're building, the services that you're providing. You're a definitely an inspiration. If people would like to contact you or keep up with you, how should they do it? Yeah, they can hit me up on, on Twitter. Our company is Airbits, A-I-R-B-I-T-Z. Um, Paul at Airbits.co is my email. So feel free to, to ping if you have any questions about Airbits or myself. Um, I'm headed to, you know, conferences here and there in the Bitcoin space. I'll actually be at South by Southwest if this airs in time. Uh, I'll be there on March 12th giving a workshop talk on Bitcoin blockchain, setting people up with wallets. Awesome, Paul. Thank you so much, Paul. Thanks for coming on. Liberty Entrepreneurs, and please keep building freedom. Cool. Thanks much. 
All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening to episode 64 with Paul Ploy of Airbits. If you've been enjoying season one of Liberty Entrepreneurs about virtual assistants, then head on over to our website and download our top 27 tasks to delegate to a virtual assistant. It's a free PDF guide that I've put together to help you figure out how you can reclaim some of your time and get out of the mundane day-to-day tasks by hiring a virtual assistant to your team. And these are my top 27 tasks that I've found to be the best to delegate away. That's libertyentrepreneurs.com forward slash season and the number one. All of our season one episodes are available at that page as well as the show notes and all podcast resources. So until next week, keep building freedom. Peace.